Hello, students. Um, the reading for this week is a very famous classical text called Makurat no Soshi, or the Pillow Book, as it's often translated as. Um, it's by one of the great female writers of the Heian period, uh, the great uh, age of classical antiquity. And uh, the author's name is Sei Shonagon, Sei Shonagon, born in 965. And I will put some information about the author and about some background information about this text in your uh, study guides that you will have to consult with as you read this text and answer the questions on your study guide. In this video, rather than uh, reciting it as I usually do, I'm going to have my student assistant, Nicole Ellison, who studied with me at uh, Nagoya University of Foreign Studies a few years ago and is now, well, I'll let her introduce herself in a second, but um, she is my uh, teacher teaching assistant for this class for this semester. So she will be reciting not the entire text, so that would take uh, several days. It's a very long, fat text, uh, but we have some of the most uh, salient and famous passages from that work in this uh, PDF file that you guys all have. And the translation, is, English translation is on the left side, and the translation is by Ivan Morris. Done, It was done, I think, in the 1950s, and it's now in the public domain, so uh, I shouldn't have, we shouldn't encounter any problems uh, posting this online. And the original classical Japanese is on the right side of your PDF file, so uh, we will review that and go over that in class as well. Okay, so now let's make sure we're not, on, uh, we're not on scroll. Hold on one second as I move this to scroll. Okay, so um, now Nicole Ellison, my assistant, is going to read the story. But before she does that, she's going to introduce herself uh, very briefly and then begin to read the story. All right, I will see you all in class. I will retire to the background. <laughs> now. Of course. Okay. And, uh, all right. Uh, hello. So as... Uh, Mor Mr. Morrison just said, I used to be a student a couple years back at Nagoya University at Nagoya University of Foreign Studies, but now I am a research student at Nagoya University, and I will be the teaching assistant for this class. Uh, let's all get along, anyway. And let's start. Okay, so say Shonagon, the pillow book. And this is the, the section book. name is called In Spring. In Spring, it is the dawn. In Spring, it is the dawn that is the most beautiful. As the light creeps over the hills, their outlines are dyed a faint red and wisps of purplish cloud trail over them. In summer, the nights, not only when the moon shines, but on dark nights too, as the fireflies flit to and fro, and even when it rains, how beautiful it is. In autumn, the evenings, when the glittering sun sinks close to the edge of the hills and the crows fly back to their nests in threes and fours and twos, more charming still is a file of wild geese, like specks in the distant sky. When the sun has set, one's heart is moved by the sound of the wind and the hum of the insects. In winter, the early mornings, it is beautiful indeed when snow has fallen during the night, but splendid too when the ground is white with frost, or even when there is no snow or frost, but it is simply very cold, and the attendants hurry from room to room, stirring up the fires and bringing charcoal. How well this fits the season's mood. But as noon approaches and the cold wears off, no one bothers to keep the, bla the braziers alight, and soon nothing remains but piles of white ashes. The next section. That parents should bring up some beloved son. That parents should bring up some beloved son of theirs to be a priest is really distressing. No doubt is an auspicious thing to do, but unfortunately most people are convinced that a priest is as unimportant as a piece of wood, and they treat him accordingly. Oh, it's going a little fast. I lost my thing. It's okay. We're going a little fast. Um, let me back up a little bit. Where was it? It was like the second paragraph. A priest? Uh, yes. A priest lives poorly on meager food and cannot even sleep without being criticized. While he is young, it is only natural that he should be curious about all sorts of things. And, if there are women about, he will probably peep in their direction. Though, to be sure with a look of aversion on his face. What is wrong about that? Yet people immediately find fault with him for even so small a lapse. The lot of an exorcist is still more painful. On his pilgrimage to Mitake, Kumano, and all the other sacred mountains, he often undergoes the greatest hardships. When people come to hear that his prayers are effective, they summon him here and there to perform services of the exorcism. The more popular he becomes, the less peace he enjoys. Sometimes he will be called to see a patient who is seriously ill, and he has to exert all his powers to cast out the spirit that is causing the affliction. But if he dozes off, exhausted by his efforts, people say reproachfully, 
Really, this priest is nothing but sleep. Such comments are most embarrassing for the exorcist, and I can imagine how he must feel. That is how things used to be. Nowadays, priests have a somewhat easier life. The Cat Who Lived in the Palace The cat who lived in the palace had been awarded the headdress of nobility and was called Lady Mulbu. Miobu. She was a very pretty cat, and his majesty saw to it that she was treated with the greatest care. One day, she wandered onto the veranda, and Lady Uma, the nurse in charge of her, called out, Oh, you naughty thing, please come inside at once. But the cat paid no attention and went on basking sleepily in the sun. Intending to give her a scare, the nurse called for the dog, Okinamaro. Okinamaro, where are you? she cried. Come and bite Lady Miobu. The foolish Okinamaro, believing it, believing that the nurse was in earnest, rushed at the cat, who, startled and terrified, ran behind the blind in the imperial dining room where the emperor happened to be sitting. Greatly surprised, his majesty picked up the cat and held her in his arms. He summoned his gentlemen in waiting. When Tadataka, the chamberlain appeared. His majesty ordered that Okinamaro be chastised and banished to Dog Island. The attendants all started to chase the dog amid great confusion. His majesty also approached Lady Uma. We shall have to find a new nurse for our cat, he told her. I no longer feel I can count on you to look after her. Lady Uma bowed. Thereafter, she no longer appeared in the emperor's presence. The imperial guards quickly succeeded in catching Okinamaru and drove him out of the palace grounds. Poor dog. He used to swagger about so happily. Recently, on the third day of the third month, when the controller first secretary paraded him through the palace grounds, Okinamaru was adjoined, adorned with garlands of willow leaves, peach blossoms on his head, and cherry blossoms round his body. How could the dog imagine that this would be his fate? We all felt sorry for him. When Her Majesty was having her meals, recalled one of the ladies-in-waiting, Okinamaru always used to be in, tenden, in attendance and sit opposite us. How I miss him! It was about noon, a few days after Okinamaru's banishment, that we heard a dog howling fearfully. How could any dog possibly cry so long? All the other dogs rushed out in excitement to see what was happening. Meanwhile, a woman who served as a cleaner in the palace latrines ran up to us. It's terrible, she said. Two of the chamberlains are flogging a dog. They'll surely kill him. He's been punished for having come back after he was banished. It's Tadataka and Sanefusa who are beating him. Obviously, the victim was Okinamaru. I was absolutely wretched and sent a servant to ask the men to stop, but just then the howling finally ceased. He's dead, one of the servants informed me. They've thrown his body outside the gate. That evening, while we were sitting in the palace bemoaning Okinamaru's fate, a wretched-looking dog walked in. He was trembling all over, and his body was fearfully swollen. Oh dear, said one of the ladies-in-waiting. Can this be Okinamaru? We haven't seen any other dog like him recently, have him? Have we? We called to him by name, but the dog did not respond. Some of us insisted that it was Okinamaru, others that, that it was not. Please send for Lady Ukon, said the Empress, hearing our discussion. She will certainly be able to tell. We immediately went to Ukon's room and told her that it would and told her she was wanted on an urgent matter. Is this Okinamaru? the Empress asked her, pointing to the dog. Well, said Ukon, it certainly looks like him, but I cannot believe this loathsome creature is really our Okinamaru. When I called Okinamaru, he always used to come to me wagging his tail. But this dog does not react at all. No, it cannot be the same one. And besides, wasn't Okinamaru beaten to death and his body thrown away? How could any dog be alive after being flogged by two strong men? Hearing this, Her Majesty was very unhappy. When it got dark, we gave the dog something to eat, but he refused it, and we finally decided that this could not be Okinamaru. On the following morning, I went to attend the Empress while her hair was being dressed, and she was performing her ablution, ab ablutions. I was holding up the mirror for her when the dog we had seen on the previous evening slunk into the room, and crouched next to one of the pillars. Poor Okinamaru, I said. He had such a dreadful beating yesterday. How sad to think he is dead. I wonder what body he has been born into this time. Oh, how he must have suffered. At that moment, the dog lying by the pillar started to shake and tremble and shed a flood of tears. It was astounding. So this really was Okinamaro. On the previous night, it was to avoid betraying himself that he refused to answer to his name. We are immensely moved and pleased. Well, well, Okinamaro, I said, putting down the mirror. 
The dog stretched himself flat on the floor and yelped loudly, so the empress beamed with delight. All the ladies gathered round, and Her Majesty summoned Lady Ukon. When the empress explained what had happened, everyone talked and laughed with great excitement. The news reached His Majesty, and he too came to the empress's room. "'It's amazing,' he said with a smile, "'to think even a dog has such deep feelings. When the emperor's ladies-in-waiting heard the story, they too came along in a great crowd. Okinamaro, we called, and this time the dog rose and limped about the room with his swollen face. He must have a meal prepared for him, I said. Yes, said the empress, laughing happily. Now that Okinamaro has finally come, finally told us who he is. The chamberlain, Tarataka, was informed, and he hurried along from the table room. Is it really true, he asked. Please let me see for myself. I sent a maid to him with the following reply. Alas, I am afraid that this is not the same dog after all. Well, answered Tadaka, Tadataka, whatever you say, I shall sooner or later have occasion to see the animal. You won't be able to hide him from me indefinitely. Before long, Okinamata was granted an imperial pardon and returned to his former happy state. Yet even now, when I remember how he whimpered and trembled in response to our sympathy, it strikes me as strange and moving. When people talk to me about it, I start crying to myself. Depressing things. A dog howling in the daytime. A wickerwork fishnet in the spring. A red plum blossom dress in the third or fourth months. A lying in room when the baby has died. A cold, empty brassiere. An ox driver who hates his oxen. A scholar whose wife has one girl child after another. One has gone to a friend's house to avoid an unlucky direction, but nothing is done to entertain one. If this should happen at the time of a seasonal change, it is still more depressing. A letter arrives from the provinces, but no gift accompanies it. It would be bad enough if such a letter reached one in the provinces from someone in the capital, but then at least it would have interesting news about goings on in society that would be a consolation. One has written a letter, taking pains to make it attractive as possible, and now one impatiently waits the reply. Surely the messenger should be back by now, one thinks. Just then he returns, but in his hand he carries, not a reply, but one's own letter still twisted or knotted as it was sent, but now so dirty and crumpled that even the ink mark on the outside has disappeared. Not at home, answers the messenger, or else. They said they were observing a day of abstinence and would not accept it. Oh, how depressing. Again, one has sent one's carriage to fetch someone who, said, who had said he would definitely pay a visit on that day. Finally, it returns with a great clatter, and the servants hurry out with cries of, Here they come! But next one hears the carriage being pulled in the coach house, and the unfastened shafts clatter to the ground. What does this mean? one asks. The person was not at home, replies the driver, and will not be coming. So saying, he leads the ox back to its stall, leaving the carriage in the coach house. With much bustle and excitement, a young man has moved into the house of a certain family as the daughter's husband. One day he fails to come home, and it turns out that some high-ranking court lady has taken him as a lover. How depressing. Will he eventually tire of the woman and come back to us? The wife's family wonder ruefully. The nurse who is looking after a baby leaves the house, saying that she will be back presently. Soon this child starts calling, crying for her. One tries to comfort it by games and other diversions, and even sends a message to the nurse telling her to return immediately. Then comes her reply, I'm afraid I cannot be back this evening. This is not only depressing, it is no less than hateful. Yet how much more distressed must it be, the young man who has sent a message to fetch a lady friend who awaits her arrival in vain? It is quite late at night and a woman has been expecting a visitor. Hearing finally a stealthy tapping, she sends her maid to open the gate and lies waiting excitedly. But the name announced by the maid is that of someone with whom she has absolutely no connection. Of all depressing things, this is by far the worst. With a look of complete self-confidence on his face, an exorcist prepares to expel an evil spirit from his patient. Handing his mace, rosary, and other paraphernalia to the medium who is assisting him, he begins to recite his spells in the special shrill tone that he forces from his throat on such occasions. For all the exorcist's eff exorcist efforts, the spirit gives no sign of leaving, and the guardian demon fails to take possession of the medium. The relations and friends of the patients who are gathered in the room praying find this rather unfortunate. After he has recited his incantations for the length of an entire watch, the exorcist is worn out. The guardian demon is completely inactive, he tells his medium. You may leave. Then, as he takes back his rosary, he adds, Well, well, it hasn't worked. He passes his hand over the forehead, then yawns deeply, he, of all people, and leans back against the pillar for a nap. 
Most depressing is the household of some hopeful candidate who fails to receive a post during the period of official appointments. Hearing that the gentleman was bound to be successful, several people have gathered in his house for the occasion. Among them are a number of retainers who served him in the past, but who since have either been in engaged elsewhere or moved to some remote province. Now they are all eager to accompany their former master on his visit to the shrines and temples, and their carriages pass to and fro in the courtyard. Indoors there is a great commotion as the hangers-on help themselves to food and drink. Yet the dawn of the last day of the appointments arrives, and still no one has knocked at the gate. The people in the house are nervous and prick up their ears. Presently, they hear shouts of forerunners and realize that the high dignitaries are leaving the palace. Some of the servants were sent to the palace on the previous evening to hear the news and have been waiting all night, trembling with cold. Now they've come trudging back listlessly. The attendants who have remained faithfully in the gentleman's service year after year cannot bring themselves to ask what has happened. His former retainers, however, are not so different. Tell us, they say, what appointment did His Excellency receive? Indeed, murmur the servants. His Excellency was governor of such and such a province. Everyone was counting on his receiving a new appointment and is desolated by this failure. On the following day, the people who had crowded in the house begin to sink away in twos and threes. The old attendants, however, cannot leave so easily. They walk restlessly about the house, counting on their fingers the provincial appointments that will become available in the following year. Pathetic and depressing in the extreme. One has sent a friend a verse that turned out fairly well. How depressing when there is no reply poem. Even in the case of love poems, one should at least answer that they were moved at receiving the message, or something of the sort. Otherwise, they will cause the keenest disappointment. Someone who lives in a bustling, fashionable household receives a message from an elderly person who is behind the times and has very little to do. The poem, of course, is old-fashioned and dull. How depressing. One needs a particularly beautiful fan for some special occasion and instructs an artist, in whose talent one has full confidence to decorate one with an appropriate painting. When the day comes and the fan is delivered, one is shocked to see how badly it has been painted. Oh, the dreariness of it. A messenger arrives with a present at a house where a child has been born, or where someone is about to leave on a journey. How depressing for him if he gets no reward. People should always reward a messenger, though he may bring only herbal balls or hare sticks. If he expects nothing, he'll be particularly pleased to be rewarded. On the other hand, what a terrible letdown. If he arrives with a self-important look on his face, his heart pounding in anticipation of a generous reward, only to have his hopes dashed. A man has moved in as his son-in-law, yet even now, after some five years of marriage, the lying room has remained as quiet as on the day of his arrival. An elderly couple who have several grown-up children, and who may even have some grandchildren crawling about the house, are taking a nap in the daytime. The children who see them in this state are overcome by a forlorn feeling, and for other people it is all very depressing. To take a hot bath when one has just woken is not only depressing, it actually puts one in a bad humor. Persistent rain on the last day of the year. One has been observing a period of fast, but neglects it for just one day. Most, re most depressing. A white underrobe in the eighth month. A wet nurse who has run out of milk. Hateful things. One is in a hurry to leave, but one's visitor keeps chattering away. If it is someone of no importance, one can get rid of him by saying, You must tell me all about it next time. But should it be the sort of visitor whose presence commands one's best behavior, the situation is hateful indeed. One finds that a hair has got caught in the stone on which one is rubbing one's instick, or against that gravel that is lodged in the ink stick, making a nasty, grating sound. Someone has suddenly fallen ill, and one summons the exorcist. Since he is not at home, one has to send messengers to look for him. After one has a long, fretful wait, the exorcist finally arrives, and with a sigh of relief one asks him to start his incantations, but perhaps he has been exercising too many evil spirits recently, for hardly has he installed himself and begun praying when his voice becomes drowsy. Oh, how hateful. A man who has nothing in particular to recommend him discusses all sorts of subject at random as though he knew everything. An elderly person warms the palms of his hands over a brazier and stretches out the wrinkles. No young man would dream of behaving in such a fashion. Old people can really be quite shameless. I have seen some dreary old creatures acting restless on their feet on the brazier and rubbing them against the edge while they speak. These are the kind of people who, in visiting someone's house, first use their fans to wipe away the dust from the mat, and, when they finally sit on it, cannot stay still but are forever spreading out the front of their hunting costume or even tucking it up under their knees. One might suppose that such behavior was restricted to people of humble, of humble station, but I have observed it in quite some well-bred people, 
including a senior secretary of the fifth rank in the Ministry of Ceremonial and a former governor of Suduga. I hate the sight of men in their cups who shout, poke their fingers in their mouths, stroke their beards, and pass on the wine to their neighbors with great cries of, have some more, drink up. They tremble, shake their heads, twist their faces, and gesticulate like children who are singing. We're off to see the governor. I have seen really well-bred people behave like this, and I find it most distasteful. To envy others and to complain about one's own lot, to speak badly about people, to be indis inquisitive about the most trivial matters, and to resent and abuse people for not telling one, or, if one does manage to worm out some facts, to inform everyone in the most delighted fashion, as if one known, from, known all from the beginning. Oh, how hateful. One is just about to be told some interesting piece of news when a baby starts crying. A flight of crows circle about with loud caws. An admirer has come on a clandestine visit, but a dog catches sight of him and starts barking. One feels like killing the beast. One has been foolish enough to invite a man to spend the night in an unsuitable place, and then he starts snoring. A gentleman has visited one secretly. Though he is wearing a tall, lacquered hat, he nevertheless wants no one to see him. He is so flurried, in fact, that upon leaving he bangs into something with his hat. Most hateful. It is annoying, too, when he lifts up the EO blind that hangs at the entrance of the room, and then lets it fall with a great rattle. If it is a head blind, things are still worse, for being more solid makes a terrible noise when it is dropped. There is no excuse for such carelessness. Even a head blind does not make any noise if one lifts it up gently on entering and leaving the room. The same applies to sliding doors. If one's movements are rough, even a paper door will bend and resonate when opened. But if one lifts the door a little while pushing it, there need be no sound. One has gone to bed and about to doze off when a mosquito appears, announcing himself in a reedy voice. One can actually feel the wind made by his wings and, slight though it is, finds himself in a hateful, finds it hateful in the extreme. A carriage passes with a nasty, creaking noise. Annoying to think that the passengers may not even be aware of this. If I am traveling in someone's carriage and I hear it creaking, I dislike it. I dislike not only the noise, but also the owner of the carriage. One is in the middle of a story when someone butts in and tries to show that he is the only clever person in the room. Such a person is hateful, and so, indeed, is anyone, child or adult, who tries to push himself forward. One is telling a story about old times when someone breaks in with a little detail that he happens to know, implying that one's own version is inaccurate. Disgusting behavior. Very hateful is a mouse that scurries all over the place. Some children have called at one's house. One makes a great fuss of them and gives them toys to play with. The children become accustomed to this treatment and start to come regularly, forcing their way into one's inner rooms and scattering one's furnishings and possessions. Hateful. A certain gentleman, whom one does not want to see visit at one, one at home or in the palace, and one pretends to be asleep. But a maid comes to tell one and shakes one awake, with a look on her face that says, What a sleepy head. Very hateful. A newcomer pushes ahead of the other members in a group. With a knowing look, this person starts laying down the law and forcing advice upon everyone. Most hateful. A man with whom one is having an affair keeps singing the praises of some woman he used to know. Even if it is a thing of the past, this can be very annoying. How much more so if he is still seeing the woman, yet sometimes I find that this is not as unpleasant as all that. A person who recites a spell himself after sneezing. In fact, I detest anyone who sneezes, except the master of the house. Fleas, too, are very hateful. When they dance about under someone's clothes, they really seem to be lifting them up. The sound of dogs when they bark for a long time in chorus is ominous and hateful. I cannot stand people who leave without closing the panel behind them. How I detest the husbands of nursemaids. It is not so bad if the child is the maid, in the maid's charge is a girl, because then the man will keep his distance. But if it is a boy, he will behave as though he were the father. Never letting the boy out of his sight, he insists on managing everything. He regards the other attendants in the house as less than human, and, if anyone tries to scold the child, he slanders him to the master. Despite this disgraceful behavior, no one dare accuse the husband, so we stride about the house with a proud, self-important look, giving all the orders. I hate people whose letters show that they lack respect for worldly civil civilities, whether it be by discourtesy in the phrasing or by extreme politeness to someone who does not deserve it. This sort of thing is, of course, most odious if the letter is for oneself, but is bad enough even if it is addressed to someone else. As a matter of fact, most people are too casual not only in their letters, but in a direct conversation. Sometimes I am quite disgusted at noting how little decorum people observe when talking to each other. It is particularly unpleasant to hear some foolish man or woman emit the proper mark of respect when addressing a person of quality, 
And when servants fail to use honorific forms of speech in referring to their masters, it is very bad indeed. No less odious, however, are those masters who, in addressing their servants, use such phrases as, when you were good enough to do such and such, or as you so kindly remarked. No doubt there are some masters who, in describing their own, a own actions to a servant, say, I presume to do so and so. Sometimes the person who is utterly devoid of charm will try and create a good impression by using very elegant language, yet he only succeeds in being ridiculous. No doubt he believes his refined language to be just what the occasion demands, but when it goes so far that everyone bursts out laughing, surely something must be wrong. It is most important to address high-ranking courtiers, imperial advisors, and the like simply by using their names without any titles or marks of respect, but such mistakes are fortunately rare. If one refers to the maid who is in attendance on, on lady-in-waiting as madam or that lady, she will be surprised, delighted, and lavish in her praise. When speaking to young noblemen and courtiers of high rank, one should always, unless their majesties are present, refer to them by their official posts. Incidentally, I have been very shocked to hear important people use the word I while conversing in their majesty's presence. Such a breach of etiquette is really distressing, and I fail to see why people cannot avoid it. A man who has nothing in particular to recommend him, but who speaks in an affected tone and poses as, behave as being elegant. An inkstone with such a hard, smooth surface that the stick glides over it without leaving any deposit of ink. Ladies in waiting who want to know everything that is going on. Someone greatly dislikes a person for no particular reason, and then that person goes and does something hateful. A gentleman who travels alone in his carriage to see a procession, or some other spectacle. What sort of man is he? Even though he may not be a person of the greatest quality, surely he should have taken along a few of the many young men who are anxious to see the sights. But no, he sits there by himself, and one can see his silhouette through the blinds, with a proud look on his face, keeping all his impressions to himself. A lover who is leaving at dawn announces that he has to find his fan and his paper. I know I put them somewhere last night, he says. Since it is pitch dark, he gropes about the room, bumping into the furniture and muttering, Strange, where on earth can they be? Finally, he discovers the objects. He thrusts the paper into the breast of his robe and with a great rustling sound, and then he snaps open his fan and bustily fans away with it. Only now is he ready to take his leave. What charmless behavior! Hateful is an understatement. Equally disagreeable is the man who, when leaving in the middle of the night, takes care to fasten the cord of his headdress. This is quite unnecessary. He could perfectly well put it, put it gently on his head without trying the cord. And why must he spend time adjusting his cloak or hunting costume? Does he really think someone may see him at this time of night and criticize him for not being impeccably dressed? A good lover will behave as elegantly at dawn as any other time. He drags himself out of bed with a look of dismay on his face. The lady urges him on. Come, my friend, it's getting light. You don't want anyone to find you here. He gives a deep sigh as if to say that the night has not nearly been long enough and that is agony to leave. Once up, he does not instantly pull on his trousers. Instead, he, closes to, he comes close to the lady and whispers whatever was left unsaid during the night. Even when he is dressed, he still lingers, vaguely pretending to be fastening his sash. Presently, he raises the latrice, and the two lovers stand side by side, stand by the side door while he tells her how he dreads the coming day, which will keep them apart. Then he slips away. The lady watches him go, and this moment of parting will remain among her most charming memories. Indeed, one's attachment to a man depends largely on the elegance of his leave-taking. When he jumps out of bed, scurries about the room, tightly fastens his trouser sash, rolls up the sleeves of his court, court cloak, overrobe, or hunting costume, stuffs his belonging into the breast of his robe, and then briskly secures the outer sash, one really begins to hate him. A preacher ought to be good-looking. A preacher ought to be good-looking. For if we are properly to understand his worthy sentiments, we must keep our eyes on him while he speaks. Should we look away, we may forget to listen. Accordingly, an ugly preacher may well be the source of sin. But I really must stop writing this kind of thing. If I were still young enough, I might risk the consequence of putting down such impieties. impieties. But at my present stage of life, I should be less flippant. Some people, on hearing that a priest is particularly venerable and pious, rush off to the temple where he is preaching, determined to arrive before anyone else. They too are liable to bring a load of sin on themselves and would do better to stay away. In earlier times, men who had retired from the post of Chamberlain did not ride at the head of the imperial processions. In fact, during the year of their retirement, they hardly ever appeared outside their houses and did not dream of showing themselves in the precincts of the palace. Things seem to have changed. Nowadays, they are all known as fifth-rank Chamberlains 
and given all sorts of official jobs. Even so, time often hangs heavy on their hands, especially when they recall their busy days in active service. Though these fifth-ranked chamberlains keep the fact to themselves, they know they have a good deal of leisure. Men like this frequently repair to temples and listen to the popular priests. Such visits eventually become a habit. One will find them there even on hot summer days, decked out in bright linen robes, with loose trousers of light violet or bluish gray spread about them. Sometimes they will have taboo tags attached to their back lacquered headdresses. Far from preferring to stay at home on such auspicious days, they apparently believe that no harm can come to anyone bent on so worthy an errand. They arrive hastily, converse with the priest, look inside the carriages that are being lined up outside the temple, and take an interest in everything. Now a couple of gentlemen who have not met for some time run into each other in the temple, and are greatly surprised. They sit down together and chat away, nodding their heads, exchanging funny stories, and opening their fans wide to hold before their faces so as to laugh more freely. Toying with their elegant decorated ros rosaries, they glance about, criticizing some defect they have, no they have noticed in one of the carriages or praising the elegance of another. They discuss various services that have recently attended and compare the skill of different priests in permitting the eight lessons or the dedication of sutras. Meanwhile, of course, they pay not the slightest attention to the service actually in progress. To be sure, it would not interest them very much, for they have heard it all so often that the priest's words could no longer make any impression. After the priest has been on his dies for some time, a carriage stops outside the temple. The outriders clear the way in somewhat perfunctory fashion, and the passengers get out. They are slender young gentlemen, clad either in hunting costumes or in the court cloaks that look lighter than a cicada's wings, loose trousers, and unlined robes of raw silk. As they enter the temple, accompanied by an equal number of attendants, the worshippers, including those who have been there since the beginning of the service, move back to make room for them. The young men install themselves at the foot of a pillar, near the dais. As one would expect from such people, they now make a great show of rubbing their rosaries and protesting, prostrating themselves in prayer. The priest, convinced by the sight of the newcomers that this is a grand occasion, launches out an impressive sermon that he presumes will make his name in society. But no sooner have the young men settled down and finished touching their heads to the floor that they begin to think about leaving at the first opportunity. Two of them steal glances at the women's carriages outside, and it is easy to imagine what they are saying to each other. They recognize one of the women and admire her elegance. Then, catching the sight of a stranger, they discuss who she can be. I find it fascinating to see such going-ons in a temple. Often one hears exchanges like this. There was a service at such-and-such such temple where they did the eight lessons. Was Lady So-and-so present? Of course. How could she possibly have missed it? It is really too bad that they should always answer like this. One would imagine that it would be all right for ladies of quality to visit temples and take a discreet look at the preacher's dies. After all, even women of humble station may listen devoutly to religious sermons. Yet, in the old days, ladies almost never walked to temples to attend servants, sermons. On the rare visits that they did undertake, they had to walk elegant traveling costumes, as when making proper pilgrimage to shrines and temples. If people of those times had lived long enough to see the recent conduct in the temples, how they would have criticized the woman of our day. Elegant things. A white coat worn over a violet waistcoat. Duck eggs. Shaved ice mixed with liana syrup and put in a new silver bowl. A rosary of rock crystal. Wisteria blossoms. Plum blossoms covered with snow. A pretty child eating strawberries. Rare things. A son-in-law who is praised by his adoptive father. A young bride who is loved by her mother-in-law. A silver tweezer that is good at plucking out the hair. A servant who does not speak badly about his master. A person who is in no way eccentric or imperfect, who is superior in both mind and body, and who remains flawless all his life. People who live together and still manage to behave with reserve towards each other. However much these people may try to hide their weakness, they usually fail. To avoid getting ink stains on the notebook into, one, into which one is copying stories, poems, or the like, if it is a very fine notebook, one takes the greatest care not to make a blot, yet somehow one always never seems to, to succeed. When people, whether they be men or women or priests, have promised each other eternal friendship, it is rare for them to stay on good terms until the end. A servant who is pleasant to his master. One has given some silk to the fuller, and when he sends it back, it is so beautiful that one cries in admiration. Embarrassing things. While entertaining a visitor, one hears some servants chattering without any restraint in one of the back rooms. It is embarrassing to know that one's visitor can overhear. But how to stop them? 
a man who a man whom one loves to get drunk and keeps repeating himself to have spoken about someone not knowing that he could overhear this is embarrassing even if it is to be a servant or some other completely insignificant person to hear one's servants making merry this is equally annoying if one is on a journey and staying in a cramped quarters or a home and hears the servants in a neighboring room parents convinced that their ugly child is adorable pet him and repeat things he has said imitating his voice an ignoramus who in the presence of some learned person puts on a knowing air and converses about men of old. A man recites his own poems, not especially good ones, and tells about one about the praises they have received. Most embarrassing. Lying awake at night, one says something to one's companion, who simply goes on sleeping. In the presence of a skilled musician, someone plays a zither just for his own pleasure and without tuning it. A son-in-law, who has long since stopped visiting his wife, runs into his father-in-law in a public place. Things that give a hot feeling. The hunting costume of the head of a guard's escort. A patchwork surplus. A captain in attendance at the Imperial Games. An extremely fat person with a lot of hair. A zither bag. A holy teacher performing a rite of incantation at noon in the sixth or seventh month. Or at the same time of the year, a coppersmith working in his foundry. Things that have lost their power. A large boat which is high and dry in a creek at ebb tide. A woman who has taken off her false locks to comb the short hair that remains. A large tree that has been blown down in a gale and, live, and lies on its side with its roots in the air. The retreating figure of a sumo wrestler who has been defeated in a match. A man of no importance reprimanding an attendant. An old man who removes his hat, uncovering his scanty top knot. A woman who is angry with her husband about some trifling matter, leaves home and goes somewhere to hide. She is certain that he will rush about looking for her, but he does nothing of the kind and shows the most infuriating indifference. Since she cannot stay away forever, she swallows her pride and returns. Adorable Things The face of a child drawn on a melon. A baby sparrow that comes hopping up when one imitates the squeak of a mouse. Or again, when one has tied it with a thread round its leg, and its parents bring insects or worms and pop them in its mouth. Delightful. A baby of two or so is crawling rapidly along the ground. With his sharp eyes, he catches sight of a tiny object and, picking it up with his pretty little fingers, takes it to show to a grown-up person. A child whose hair has been cut like a nun's is extinguishing something. The hair falls over his eyes, but instead of brushing it away, he holds his head to the side. The pretty white cords of his trouser shirt skirt are tied around his shoulders, and this, too, is most adorable. A young palace page, who is still quite small, walks by a ceremo in ceremonial costume. One picks up a pretty baby and hold him for, holds him for a while in one's arms. While one is fondling him, he clings to one's neck and then falls asleep. The objects used during the display of dolls. One picks up a tiny lotus leaf that is floating on a pond and examines it. Not only lotus leaves, but little hollyhock flowers, and indeed all small things, are most adorable. An extremely plump baby, who is about a year old and has, lovely white, and has a lovely white skin, comes crawling towards one, dressed in a long gauze robe of violet with the sleeves tucked up. A little boy of about eight who reads aloud from a book in his childish voice. Pretty white chicks, who are still not fully fledged and look as if their clothes are too short for them. Cheeping loudly, they follow one on their long legs, or walk to close to the mother hen. Duck eggs, an urn containing the relics of some holy person. Wild pinks. While we were mourning for the Chancellor. While we were mourning for the Chancellor, Her Majesty had to leave the palace on the occasion of the Great Purification at the end of the sixth months. Since the Empress's office lay in an unlucky direction, she proceeded to the dining hall of the High Court Notables. It was terribly hot that first evening, and so dark one that one could not see anything. We spent a rather anxious night in our cramped quarters. On the following morning, when we got up and looked about, we found that the building was a low, flat structure with a tiled roof that gave it a particular Chinese air. There were none of the usual lattices, only bamboo blinds hanging down all around the room. Yet the place was strangely charming. While we were staying there, I and the other ladies-in-waiting used to go into the garden for a walk every morning. Conspicuous among, among the plants were the masses of flowers known as yellow daylilies, which grew along the bamboo fence and looked just right in front of this particular building. The time office was directly next door, and the gong sounded different from usual. Some of the younger ladies in our group were curious to hear it, 
and one day about twenty of them ran over to the building and climbed the high bell tower. I stayed at the bottom and looked up at them. As they stood there in their light gray skirts, Chinese jackets matching dresses of unlined silk, and scarlet petticoats, they really looked as if they might have descended from heaven, though one could hardly have called them angels. I also enjoyed watching the faces of some of the other ladies, who, though not quite as young as the ones in the towers, could not join them because of their own superior rank and were looking up at them enviously. When the sun had set, the older woman joined the younger ones, under the cover of darkness, and, and they all set off for the guardhouse. It appears that, when they arrived there, they played about and laughed so noisily that the guardhouse attendants became angry. "'What a way to behave!' they exclaimed, and accused the ladies of having climbed into the chairs normally occupied by the high court nobles, and of having upset and damaged the benches used by the members of the great council of state. But the woman paid no attention. Perhaps because the building was very old and covered with tiles, it became unspeakably hot at night, and we slept outside the blinds. All day long, centipedes kept falling from the ceiling, this also because the building was so old, and the great dubs of hornets flew into our room. This we found very frightening. Every day, senior courtiers came to call, and often they stayed talking until late at night. When one of them heard a lady-in-waiting say something about the dining hall, he delighted us by reciting, who would have believed it, that the grounds of the great council would soon become a pleasure garden. Autumn came, but in our cramped quarters no cooling wind wafted from any side. We could, however, hear the sound of autumn insects. On the eve of the empress's return to the palace, on the 8th, the two stars seemed closer than usual. This, too, was no doubt because the building and its garden were so cramped. When I first went into waiting When I first went into waiting at Her Majesty's court, so many different things embarrassed me that I could not even reckon them, and I was already on the, always on the verge of tears. As a result, I tried to avoid appearing before the empress except at night, and even then I stayed behind a three-foot curtain of state. On one occasion, Her Majesty brought out some pictures and showed them to me, but I was so ill at ease that I could hardly stretch out my hand to take them. She pointed to one after another, explaining what each represented. Since the lamp had been put on a low tray stand, one could view the pictures even better than in the daytime, and every hair of my head was clearly visible. I managed to control my embarrassment and had a proper look. It was a very cold time of year when Her Majesty gave me the paintings I could hardly see her hands, but from what I make out, they were of a light pink hue that I found extraordinarily attractive. I gazed at the Empress with amazement. Simple as I was and accustomed to such wonderful sights, I didn't understand how a being like this could even possibly exist in our world. At dawn, I was about to hurry back to my room when Her Majesty said, even the god of Kazuraki would stay a little longer. So I sat down again, but I leaned forward sideways in such a way that Her Majesty could not see me directly and keep the latisse shut. One of the ladies who came into the room noticed this and said that it should be opened. A servant heard her and started towards it, but Her Majesty said, wait. Leave the latisse as it is. The two women went out, laughing to each other. Her Majesty then asked me various questions and finally said, I am sure you want to return to your room, so off you go. But be sure to come again this evening, and early too. As soon as I crept out of Her Majesty's presence and was back in my room, I threw open all the latisses and looked at the magnificent snow. During the day I received several notes from Her Majesty telling me to come while it was still light. The sky is clouded with snow, she wrote, and no one will be able to see you clearly. Noticing my hesitation, the lady in charge of my room urged me, saying, I don't know how you can stay shut up like this all day long. Her Majesty has granted you the extraordinary good fortune of being admitted into her presence, and she must certainly have her reasons. To be unresponsive to another person's kindness is a most hateful way to behave. This was enough to make me hurry back to the Empress, but I was overcome with embarrassment, and it was not easy for me. On my way, I was delighted to see the snow beautifully piled up on top of the fire huts, when I entered Her Majesty's room, I noticed that the usual square brazier was filled to the brim with burning charcoal and that no one was sitting next to it. The Empress herself was seated in front of a round brazier made of shen wood and decorated with pearskin liqueur. She was surrounded by a group of high-ranking ladies who were in constant attendance upon her. In the next part of the room, a tightly packed row of ladies-in-waiting sat in front of a long, rectangular brazier with their Chinese jackets worn in such a way that they trailed on the floor. Observing how they experienced how experienced they were in their duties and how easily they carried them out, I could not help but feeling envious. There was a trace of awkwardness in any of their movements as they got up to deliver notes to Her Majesty from the outside and sat down again by the brazier, talking and laughing to each other. When would I ever be able to manage like that, I wondered nervously. Still further in the back of the room sat a small group of ladies who were looking at pictures together. After a while, I heard the voices of outrunners loudly ordering people to make way. 
His Excellency, the Chancellor, is coming, said one of the ladies, and they all cleared away to their scattered belongings. I retired to the back of the room, but despite my modesty, I was curious to see the man in person, and I peeped through a crack at the bottom of the curtain of state where I was watching, where I was sitting. It turned out that it was not Michitaka, but his son, Korechika, and the major counselor. The purple of his court cloak and trousers looked magnificent against the white snow. I should not have come, he said, standing next to the pillars, because both yesterday and today are days of abstinence, but it has been snowing so hard that I felt bound to call and find out whether it was all well with you. How did you manage, said Her Majesty. I thought that all the paths were buried. Well, replied Korechika, it occurred to me that I might move, move your heart. Could anything surpass this conversation between the Empress and her brother? This was the sort of exchange that is so eloquently described in romances, and the Empress herself, arrayed in a white dress, a robe of white Chinese damask, and two more layers of scarlet damask over which her hair hung down loosely at the back, had a beauty that I had seen in paintings, but never in real life. It was all like a dream. Korechika joked with the ladies-in-waiting, and when they replied without the slightest embarrassment, freely arguing with him and contradicting his remarks when they disagreed, I was absolutely dazzled by it all and found myself blushing without any particular reason. Korechika ate a few fruits and told one of the servants to offer some to the empress. He must have asked who was behind the curtain of state, and one of the ladies must have told him that it was I, for he stood and walked to the back of the room. At first I thought he was leaving, but instead he came and sat very close to me. He began to talk about various things he had heard about me before I came into waiting, and asked whether they were true. I had been embarrassed enough when I had been looking at him from a distance with the, cur with the curtain of state between us. Now that we were actually facing each other, I felt extremely stupid and could hardly believe that this was really happening to me. In the past, when I had gone to watch imperial processions and the like, Korechika had sometimes glanced in the direction of my carriage, but I had always pulled in the inner blinds close together and hidden my face behind a fan for fear that he might see my silhouette through the blinds. I wondered how I could even, how I could have ever chosen to embark on a career which I was so ill-suited by nature. What on earth should I say to him? I was bathed in sweat and altogether in a terrible state. To make matters worse, Korechika now sees the fan behind which I had prudently hidden myself, and I realized that my hair must be scattered all over my forehead in a terrible mess. No doubt everything about my appearance bespoke the embarrassment I felt at that moment. I had hoped Korechika would leave quickly, but he showed no signs of doing so. Instead, he sat there, toying with my fan and asking who had done the paintings on it. I kept my head lowered and pressed into the sleeve of the Chinese jacket, to, the sleeve of my Chinese jacket to my face, so tightly indeed that bits of powder must have stuck to it, making my complexion all mottled. The Empress, who had no doubt realized how desperately I wanted Korechika to leave, turned to him and said, "Look at this notebook. Whose writing do you suppose it is?" I was relieved to think that now he would finally go, but instead he asked her to have the book brought to him so he could examine it. "Really," she said. You can perfectly well come here yourself and have a look. No, I can't, he replied. Shonagon has got a hold of me and won't let go. It was a very fashionable sort of joke, but hardly suited to my rank or age, and I felt terribly ill at ease. Her Majesty held up the book, in which something had been written in a cursive script, and looked at it. Well, indeed, said Korechika. Whose can it be? Let's show it to Shonagon. I'm sure she can recognize the handwriting of anyone in the world. The aim of all these absurd remarks, of course, was to draw me out. As if a single gentleman were not enough to embarrass me, another one now arrived, preceded by an outrunner who would clear the way for him. This gentleman, too, was wearing a court cloak, and he looked even more splendid than Korechika. He sat down and started telling some amazing, amusing stories, which delighted the ladies-in-waiting. Oh, yes, they said, laughing. We saw Lord So-and-so when he was... As I heard them mention the names of one other senior courtier of another, I felt they must be talking about spirits or heavenly beings who had descended to earth. Yet, after some time had passed, and I had grown accustomed to court service, I realized that there had been nothing very impressive about their conversation. No doubt these same ladies, who talked so casually to Lord Korechika, had just been embarrassed as I when they first came into waiting, but had, but had little by little become used to court society until their shyness had naturally disappeared. The Empress spoke to me for a while, and then asked, "'Are you really fond of me?' "'But, Your Majesty,' I replied, "'how could I, not pos how could I possibly not be fond of you?' Just then someone sneezed loudly in the table room. "'Oh, dear,' said the Empress. "'So you're telling a lie. Well, so be it.' And she retired into the back of the room. "'To think Her Majesty believed I was lying. If I had said that I was fairly fond of her, that would have been untrue. The real liar, I thought, was the sneezer's nose. Who could have done such a terrible thing? I dislike sneezers at the best of times, and whenever I feel like sneezing myself, I deliberately smother it. 
All the more hateful it was that someone should have sneezed at this moment. But I was still far too inexperienced to say anything that might have repaired the damage, and since the day I was donning, I retired to my room. As soon as I arrived, a servant brought me an elegant-looking letter, written on fine, smooth paper of light green. This is what Her Majesty feels, I read. Ikanishite. In what way? Ikanishiramashi. How could I know? Itsuwari A lie from the truth. Sora ni tadasu no. If the god tadasu. Kami nakariseba. We're not in the skies. My emotions were a jumble of delight and dismay, and once again I wished I could find out what it, who had sneezed on that previous night. Please give Her Majesty the following reply, I said, and help me to make up for the harm that has been done. Kosa. Okay. Usuki kosa. Sori ni mo yoranu. Hana yue ni. Ukimi no hado o. Shirozo wabishiki. A flower makes its beauty known by its color and fragrance. How miserable that a sneeze should bring such suffering. The curse of God Shiki is, of course, very terrible. Even after I had sent my reply, I still felt most unhappy and wondered why someone should have had to sneeze at such an inopportune moment. To feel that one is disliked by others. To feel that one is disliked by others is surely one of the saddest things in the world, and no one, however foolish, could wish a thing upon himself. Yet everywhere... Wherever it be in the palace, or at home, or in the bosom of the family, there are some people who are naturally liked and others who are not. Not only among people of good birth, where it goes without saying, <laughs> but even among commoners, children who are adored by their parents naturally attract the attention of outsiders, and everyone makes a great fuss over them. If they are attractive children, it is only natural that their parents should dote on them. How could it be otherwise? But if the children have nothing particular to recommend them, one can only assume that such devotion comes merely from the fact of being parents. I imagine that there can be nothing so delightful as to be loved by everyone, one's parents, one's master, and all the people with whom one is on close terms. Sympathy is the most splendid of all qualities. Sympathy is the most splendid of all qualities. This is especially true when it is found in men, but, also, but it also applies to women. Compassionate remarks of the type, how sad for you to someone who has suffered a misfortune or I can imagine what he must be feeling about a man who has some sor had some sorrow, are bound to give pleasure, however casual and perfunctory they may be. If one's remark is addressed to someone else and repeated to the sufferer, it is even more effective than if one makes it directly. The unhappy person will never forget one's kindness and will be anxious to let one know how it has moved him. If it is someone who, one, who one is close to one and who expects sympathetic inquiries, he will not be especially pleased since he is merely receiving his due. But a friendly remark passed on to less intimate people is certainly to give pleasure. This is all sounds simple enough, yet hardly anyone seems to bother. Although it seems as if men and women with good heads rarely have good hearts. Yet I suppose there must be someone who are both clever and kind. One day, when the snow lay thick on the ground. One day, when the snow lay thick on the ground, and it was so cold that the lattices had all been closed, I and the other ladies-in-waiting were sitting with Her Majesty chatting and poking the embers in the brazier. "'Tell me, Shonagong,' said the Empress, "'how is the snow on Hisang Iu Peak?' I told the maid to raise one of the lattices and then roll up the blind all the way. Her Majesty smiled. I was not alone in recognizing the Chinese poem she had quoted. In fact, all the ladies-in-waiting knew the lines and had even rewritten them in Japanese. Yet no one but me managed to think of, e think of it instantly. Yes, indeed, people said when they heard the story. She was born to serve an empress like ours. Things that are unpleasant to see. Someone in a robe whose back seam is crooked. People who wear their clothing with the collars pulled back. A high court noble's carriage that has dirty blinds. People who insist on bringing out all their children when they receive a visit from someone who rarely comes to see them. Boys who wear high clogs with their trouser skirts. I realize that this is in the modern fashion, but I still don't like it. Women in traveling costumes who walk in a great hurry. A priest who is acting as a master of divination and who wears a paper headdress to perform a service of purification. A thin, ugly woman who has dark skin and wears a wig. A lean, hirutsi man taking a nap in the daytime. Does it occur to him what a spectacle he is making of himself? Ugly men should sleep only at night, for they cannot be seen in the dark and, besides, most people are in bed themselves. But they should get up at the crack of dawn so that no one has to see them lying down.
A pretty woman looks even prettier when she gets up after taking a nap on a summer day. But an attractive woman should have unattractive woman should avoid all such things, for her face will be all puffy and shining, and, if she is not lucky, her cheeks will have an ugly, lopsided look. When two people, having taken a nap together in the daytime, wake up and see each other's sleep-swollen faces, how drearily life must seem to them. A dark-skinned person looks very ugly in an unlined robe of stiff silk. If the robe is scarlet, however, it looks better, even though it is just as transparent. I suppose one of the reasons I do not like ugly women to wear unlined robes is that one can see their navels. It is getting so dark. It is getting so dark and I can scarcely go on writing, and my brushes are worn out. Yet I should like to add a few things before I end. I wrote these notes at home when I had a good deal of time to myself and thought no one would notice what I was doing. Everything that I have seen and felt is included. Since much of it might appear malicious and even harmful to other people, I was careful to keep my book hidden. But now it has become public, which is the last thing I expected. One day, Lord Korechika, the minister of the center, brought the Empress a bundle of notebooks. What shall we do with them? Her Majesty asked me. The Emperor has already made arrangements for copying the records of the historian. Let me make them into a pillow, I said. Very well, said Her Majesty, you may have them. I now had a vast quantity of paper at my disposal, and I set about filling the notebooks with odd facts, stories from the past, and all sorts of other things, often including the most trivial material. On the whole, I concentrated on things and people that I found charming and splendid. My notes are also full of poems and observations on trees and plants, birds and insects. I was sure that when people saw my book, they would say, it's even worse than expected. Now one, now one can really tell what she is like. After all, it is written entirely for my own amusement, and I put things down exactly as they came to me. How could my casual jottings possibly bear comparison with the many impressive books that exist in our time? Readers have declared, however, that I can be proud of my work. This has surprised me greatly, yet I suppose it is not so strange that people should like it, for, as will be gathered from those notes of mine, I am the sort of person who approves of what others abhor and detest the things they like. Whatever people may think of my book, I still regret that it ever came to light. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Nico, for the lovely uh, mellif mellifluous, smooth reading. Um, yeah. Hopefully the students were able to uh, follow all the way to the end as they read along with the text. I may, might make a recitation video of the corresponding classical Japanese translation at some point, but for now, this is kind of dark in here now. Um, that's, this is the end of the uh, text. I might make a study guide for this uh, text as well and discuss some of the uh, background information and we'll delve more deeply into the uh, content and the form of this work. Um, that is all for now. I will see you all in class. Thank you again, Ms. Nicole. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>